Hello, everybody, and welcome to our special Sunday service for Pentecost Sunday. If this is your first time with us, a special warm welcome to you. I hope you'll feel readily able to be part of our online worshipping community today. In a moment, we've got a few notices telling you what's going on this week. Coming up later, we've got Bible readings from Dave Forgan. Carol Hutchings is going to be leading our prayers. I'm going to be preaching this morning. Uh, we've got a, a good mix of familiar hymns. And because this has been a special week where the archbishops have been encouraging us to pray for mission and evangelism, a week we call Thy Kingdom Come, we're going to be watching a, a special video as well. It's a short thing that the church has produced looking at the prayer lives of some Christians in the armed forces. I do hope that's a blessing to you. I certainly enjoyed watching it. So I hope you enjoy what we do this morning and that you find yourself able to encounter God in our online worship. Let's start with those notices then. First of all, if you're new today uh, and you just fancy a chat, we've got coffee and chat with the vicar online using Zoom between 10 and 11 every Sunday morning. Details of how to get into that are in our weekly newsletter and also there on our website. You should see the address appearing across the bottom of the screen about now. And if you can't make that coffee and chat, or you just want to chat some other time with me, do drop me an email and we'll work something out. This evening from six o'clock, we've got our special Pentecost focused evening prayer service, uh, which I believe is going to have some special drama in it. Uh, we'll see how that shapes up, I'm sure. And then on Wednesday at half past six, you can join us online for our regular weekly midweek communion service. Finally, we do produce these services on DVD and CD. So if you know of somebody who would be blessed by that ministry, do please drop us a line and we'll find a way of getting one of those DVDs to them. Great. Are you ready to worship then? Shall we quieten our hearts? And we're going to use these responses based around the words of the prophet Ezekiel to focus our minds in on what God has done by giving us the gift of his Holy Spirit. So if you join in with the bold text and I'll read the bits in between. But let's start by saying together, the Spirit of God fills the whole world. Alleluia. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. A new heart I will give you and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You shall be my people and I will be your God. The Spirit of God fills the whole world. Alleluia. And shall we open our worship by singing a great hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. And why don't you stand for this if you feel able?
That's a wonderful hymn, isn't it? I do hope you've enjoyed that. Why don't you take a seat and we're going to turn back to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Scripture calls us in various places to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickednesses and that we should not try to hide them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but instead confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart so that we may obtain forgiveness of them by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, we ought to do so especially when we assemble and come together to give thanks for the great blessings that we've received at his hands, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his most holy word and to ask him to supply our needs of body and soul. Therefore, I ask and call you all to approach the throne of heavenly grace with me, humbly and with pure intent, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the evil intentions and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done, and thus there is no wholeness within us. Lord, have mercy on us, pitiful sinners. Spare those who confess their sins. Restore those who truly repent, even as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live hereafter a godly, righteous and holy life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, that first Pentecost was a day when God sent his gospel out to thousands of people from different nations and all walks of life. And in keeping with that, it's good sometimes just to hear how Christians in different walks of life today are learning to depend upon the Lord's resources. So here's that short video I mentioned earlier, produced by the Thy Kingdom Come team, looking at how prayer is helping different members of the armed forces. If I fail to do my job, basically, people will die. The army will go to war, they will need equipment with them. So everything that deal with logistics support service to the British Army, that is my role. I am in charge of a team of skills technicians. We have responsibility for all the basic systems which allow a ship to be a ship, and then other people build on top of that to make a warship. The, the military is a melting pot of, of people. We have everyone in society based here. My name is Sergeant Agblecker, a logistics specialist serving in the British Army. I'm Padre Rebecca Cannon, and I'm station chaplain at RAF Benson in Oxfordshire. I am Lieutenant Commander Jonathan Tweed. I am an officer in the Royal Navy, and I'm the Marine Engineer Officer of HMS Argyle. I see people day to day who are suffering from stress, from PTSD, from mental health issues. You need a situation that beyond your ability to realize that indeed God asked you to call on him. When I was in Afghanistan, the regiment was uh, warned of that there would be IDF attack on the camp. And actually I prayed to God that your protection is my savior. You can only deliver me. I want you to deliver me with all my friends, all the people that I'm with. And indeed, the IDF did happen. And where it landed, everybody will expect that our building should have been destroyed. But God kept our building safe and everybody within it was safe. So uh, as we're getting towards the end of our most recent deployment, we came across a merchantman that was on fire. So it was also dark reasonably cold. There was a high waves which were causing us to roll heavily uh, as we sat in the water because we had to try and uh, get these survivors on board. And we were hoisting people onto our upper deck and it was 
testament to the, to the skill and dedication of our, of our sailors that nobody was injured. It was certainly challenging. One of the lovely things about being a padre is that you, you sort of, you're there as a, as a, as a conduit. We could easily tip into just being social workers, but actually the faith aspect uh, is the thing that grounds us. I think what's important for me as a, as a Christian is to have a, a basis of prayer to permeate everything that I do. If I don't, then it's me doing it in my own, my own strength, if you like. It's me doing it alone. For me, prayer is about being. It's about being present to the presence. And then from there, allowing that to seep out and touch others. Prayer to me is, is everything. Prayer to me is a communication with your maker. And Jeremiah 33 says, call unto me and I will answer you. It's the process by which I sort of remind myself of of deeper purpose and, and deeper reality in life beyond you know, all of the, the sights and sounds that crowd our senses and, and are always crying for our attention. If you want to experience God, if you want to encounter God, you have to have that communication. Prayer should be our daily life. He said, pray with that season and pray with all kind of prayer. There can sometimes be a, a temptation to pray for the machinery um, because it creates a, a lot of work when it breaks down. But um, and sometimes you know, God uses prayer to, to redirect me and show me where, where I'm getting things wrong. And sometimes he just helps me to know the right way and the best way to, to support and to lead other people. If I can be with others in some of the most difficult aspects of their lives, if I can have the strength to be with them and just be, then it sometimes gives them the ability to cope and know that there's someone alongside them, praying for them and being with them in a world that's quite busy, a world that's quite fragmented, a world that's got lots of pain. So to me, my excitement about Jesus is that he is the only son of God. So when you believe in this Jesus, one, you believe in him that he is the son of God, and he came in a human form, that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your qualification, it doesn't matter your position. If you can humble yourself and say that, God, you have not done anything wrong, but because of my sin, you came down and died for me, and I believe in you. I want you to save my life. This man will save your life. Well, before Dave Forgan brings us our Bible reading, why don't we sing again? It's a, it's a wonderful song inviting God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Rather than standing for this, why don't you stay seated and turn this into a simple and gentle prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
Our first reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that we, each of us hears them in our own naked language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jerusalem, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is taken from the Gospel according to St John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, on this Pentecost Sunday, we pray that you might touch us with your Spirit as we read your word together and reflect upon it. Speak afresh into our hearts and then fill us with your power that we might live lockdown lives that last. We ask this in the name of your glorious Son, King Jesus. Amen. You probably all know the story of the origin of the Ashes, the, the cricketing trophy that England and Australia compete for every couple of years. It's August 1882 and England need 12 runs to defeat Australia. And they have four wickets in hand. It looks a fairly safe situation until the demon bowler Fred Spofforth takes four English wickets for two runs. But even then, all was not lost. England needed just 10 to win, and they had someone who was regarded as one of the best young batsmen in the world out there on the field, a young Cambridge student called Charles Studd. But sadly, it was his rather poorer batsman partner, Ted Peat, who was facing the Australian bowling. Pete made two quick runs and was then bowled out and the game was lost. And a couple of days later, the Sporting Times published a mock obituary for English cricket 
and the bales from that day were cremated and given to the victorious colonial tourists. And a year later, Charles Studd gave up cricket forever. He wrote, what is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes to face eternity? And then he signed up with Hudson Taylor to go and work for the China Inland Mission. And after a number of years there, he moved to India and then to Central Africa, continuing mission work. And his enthusiasm for mission led to the founding of the Church Mission Society and the evangelization of the Belgian Congo, where Studd eventually died many years later, age 70, in 1931. What is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes to face eternity? And somewhere along the way, Studd wrote a rather famous short poem. Here's what he said. Only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that poem has been going round and round in my head these last few days as I've been reflecting about lockdown and Pentecost and how we can live well for God in these times. What does God want us to do with this time? Well, only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for God will last. What is it you truly want to invest your life in? Because it seems to me that all of our secular attempts at immortality, build the biggest house, the fanciest garden design, score the greatest goal, have the most popular YouTube channel, have the greatest, most beautifully ornate church building, have the biggest bank account, have the bestest business, have the hottest wife, have the most successful children, have the most successful grandchildren. None of those things actually matter. Nice though they are. Only the things we do for Christ last, which is why Pentecost Sunday is such an important day for us. I don't know what you made of that reading from the book of Acts earlier, but if it wasn't something you're familiar with, let me try and explain a little bit about what's going on. Pentecost Sunday is the day, that moment when God first poured out his Holy Spirit on his people. And it's one of those, nothing was ever the same again after that days. One of those moments in history that changed everything. Before Pentecost, God gave his Holy Spirit to his people occasionally, sporadically, and took it away again afterwards. But after Pentecost, the Spirit is here in all of us for all time. It's just often we ignore him. Often we quench his work. We're too busy relying on ourselves to reach for the unfathomable riches of the all-powerful God who reveals himself at Pentecost. So look, I've got three thoughts for you from that passage today. Three thoughts which I hope will help you as you try to build a lockdown life that lasts. Here's the first one. A lockdown life that lasts seeks God's glory. Let's start in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, that's all the Christians, about 120 of them, together in one place, when suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Violent wind tongues of fire, strange languages heard by people from all over Europe in their own tongue. What an extraordinary miracle. The power of God poured out upon his people in a way that was visible to them, but also very obvious to the crowds. And not just those who responded positively, but also those who responded negatively with mockery. That is our God showing his power. The God of the Bible, the all-powerful creator, the great designer and engineer, the one who wrote the rules of the universe, those rules the scientists love to worship. When you look around at the world, everything, every power, every person, every principle, it all depends on something. But our creator God, he depends on nothing. Nothing came before him. Nothing made him. He is or as he puts it, I am. He's the unseen hand behind all of history, the mover and shaker behind events, both large and small. He doesn't need us to make events happen, but we need him to make anything that lasts. 
He's the greatest giver of strength, of grace, of glory, of perseverance, of encouragement, of hope, of life, of purpose. Everything I have, everything that's good in my life, everything you have, everything that's good in your life is a gift from God, the greatest giver. And he's a holy God too perfectly holy no shadow or stain of sin or error in him when god looks down on dominic, dominic cummings he really is in a position to cast the first stone because he is without sin he's without deceit he is without lies god never boasts there's no self-righteousness or pride in god just holiness perfect holiness and perfect justice as well. He's the one who will judge the world, the one before whom one day we'll have to all give an account of our lives. Which is why it's rather frightening that he's also all seeing and all knowing. He knew us, not just from the moment of our conception, but from before the beginning of time. He knows what I'm truly like. Not the image you see on a screen or standing in front of you in church but what I'm like when I think no one's looking. He knows all the secrets of our hearts. He knows our deceit, our lies, our hypocrisy, our vain boasting, our self-righteous justification. And yet despite all that he knows of us, he's also a loving father, generous, patient, kind, enduringly faithful and selflessly sacrificial. As Jesus, he came into our broken world to rescue and redeem us, his broken people, the ones who rebelled against him and broke the world in the first place. And he does it by enduring our suffering and paying the ultimate price for our lives, his own life given freely, willingly, for our sake on the cross. And then three days later, God rose from the grave, showing his power again by defeating death and disease forever. And then at Pentecost, he pours that power out upon his people, the church. That's our glorious God. He's the one we live for. And if our lockdown life is to have any meaning, any purpose, we will find it in him. Any lockdown life that lasts will seek his glory, not ours. So how do you give God the glory for lockdown living? It starts, I think, by saying thank you for everything, and not just privately, but publicly. Give God the glory. Rather than dwelling on what you lack, celebrate all that God has given you. Life, health, security, food, family, friendship, a roof over your head, and most of all, the gift of faith in the God who made the heavens and the earth. If you wanna build a life that lasts, start by seeking God's glory. Second thought, if you want to build a life that lasts, partner with God. Charles Studd was a man on a mission, but it wasn't his mission. It was the mission of the creator of the universe. And it isn't just a mission for special missionaries. It's a mission for all Christians everywhere, anytime. All are called. We're all called to be ambassadors of Christ. We're all sent on a mission to proclaim the glory of our amazing God to all people in all places. Jesus says as much at the beginning of the book of Acts when he tells his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Worcestershire is the ends of the earth as far as Jesus is concerned. Pentecost isn't about us getting filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can get an electric buzz or to experience some strange miracles or to prophesy or to indulge ourselves or by speaking in tongues. Pentecost is about God partnering with us so that we can go and tell the world about Jesus. That's why it happened at the Jewish festival of Pentecost. You see, the Jewish festival of Pentecost wasn't about the Holy Spirit. It was about harvest. And God had his eyes on a very particular harvest the whole world. And we are the laborers in God's vineyard. We're the gardeners working in his garden. We are the fishermen fishing in his lake. We're the sowers sent to sow in his fields. Jesus uses many different metaphors to describe our work, but the point is the same. God 
chooses to. God delights in working through his people, through folk like you and I. He set life up so that we'll only discover the purpose and meaning of our lives as we go on that mission. Friends, if you're looking at your life and wondering why you're here, maybe you need to be asking a bigger question. What does God want me to do? The Bible tells us we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you feel purposeless, reflect on that verse at length, because God has shaped you for a purpose. Please invite him to help you discover it. Invite him to send his Holy Spirit into you, to guide you, to understand better what God has for you. But it will not take you far from the mission field. You are called to proclaim the glory of our great God. It might mean something dramatic like putting down your England cricket bat and taking up a Chinese Bible. For others, it might be something simpler, but no less important, those amazing acts of loving and serving and speaking to the people in your workplace, in your school, in your club, in your street, in the name of Jesus. The point is, we'll only discover the good works that God has shaped us to do as we partner with him. That's how we build that life that lasts. But I'm aware that probably all sounds a bit daunting. How could we possibly do any of that? Well, let me turn the question around. Do you think God would invite us into partnership and then let us fail? Do you think God would invite us into partnership and leave us wanting for resources? Do you think God would invite us into partnership and not give us everything that we need to do the work he wants us to do? So as we finish, let's think about building a life that lasts because it's powered by God. For Charles Studd, building a life that lasts began with him responding to a preacher's challenge about who he trusted with his life beyond death. He went away and thought about it and he decided he wanted to trust in the promises of Jesus. And so he got down on his knees and he said, thank you, God. And at that moment, something remarkable happens. Here's how he describes it. Joy and peace came into my soul. There's a hope for lockdown, isn't it? Joy and peace came into my soul. I knew then what it was to be born again. And the Bible, which had been so dry to me before, became everything to me. That was Charles Studd's Pentecost moment, the moment of his conversion, when the Holy Spirit came into him for the first time. So let me ask you, who are you trusting with your life beyond death? Why not do something about it now? Get in touch. We can talk more about it later. God's door is always open. He is always ready to hear from us. So respond to him when you hear him call. And then there's just the small matter of what to do with the rest of your life. Do you remember those words from the reading when Peter quoted that Old Testament prophet Joel? In the last days, by which Peter means now, by the way, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. God wants to pour out his spirit on you, into you. You see, when we start this Christian journey, God places his spirit in us. He comes to live in us by his spirit at our conversion. But the Bible talks about the need for us to go on being filled by God's spirit. And that's how we build that life that lasts, by continually asking God to pour his spirit into us. Not just for the sake of it, but so that we can serve him. And I guess he most obviously pours his spirit into us in those situations where We step out in faith, trusting that God will show up and bail us out. Peter found himself in one in our reading. He was facing that bemused crowd, muttering about some of them are drunk. And and, and Peter stands up and speaks to them. Now, if you follow Peter's life story through the Bible, through, through the Gospels, you'll see that at every opportunity that Peter has had to speak up until this point, he has messed it up. He said the wrong thing. He's boasted. He's just been rebuked by Jesus time and time again. When Peter spoke, everybody else thought, oh no, what's he going to say now? 
Peter gets up at this point and stands in front of that crowd of over 3,000 people, raises his voice and addresses the crowd with such power and clarity and authority that 3,000 respond and are saved that day. The church goes from 120 people to 3,000. Imagine that happening today. But let's not fool ourselves that it was Peter's words that did it. It was a work of God's Holy Spirit moving mightily through God's partner, Peter, who was acting to bring glory to the God who knew him in all of his failure and yet still loved him enough to die for him. God will show up through his Holy Spirit when we put ourselves into situations where we are dependent upon him. So let's build a life that lasts powered by God, by partnering with God and for the glory of God. You only have one life to live. What are you going to do with it? Only one life. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Lord, you know each of our hearts. You know what we're building. You know that often what we build isn't for you, but for us. Speak to us, Lord. Show us where we're building the wrong way and the wrong thing for the wrong goal. Rebuke us. And then in your loving mercy, forgive us. Cleanse us and send us out to bring fresh glory to you by your spirit. Renew your work in us, Lord, at this Pentecost Sunday. And equip us to live for your glory. To God be the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A life built on the glory of God. So why don't we offer him our lives now in song as we sing, To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son. Please stand if you feel able for this.
And as we continue to stand, let's declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, why don't you take a seat? And Carol Hutchings is going to come and lead us in prayer. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. We bring to you, Lord, the problems of the world, the plight of the many third world nations, the many who are starving, have no backup, no money, and no NHS to support them. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for the grace to see this world and its needs and problems through the eyes of love, hope, justice and mercy. For the grace to abandon prejudice and build bridges of reconciliation. Come Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit come. In these difficult times, as we give thanks for the many, acts of kindness being offered in our villages. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for the spirit of loving kindness to fill our homes and places of work, for family rifts to be healed and long-standing conflicts resolved. Come Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit come. We remember all those in our villages and on our prayer sheets who are ill or suffering, especially those that are lonely. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for the restoration of those who are sick to wholeness and well-being, for courage and patience in all suffering, and for good to be distilled from every painful, destructive experience. Come Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come. We commend to you all those that have died. We've had a funeral this week for Betty Hudson and we remember her and her family. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for God's merciful ju judgment on those who have died and the opportunity for us all to prepare carefully for meeting God face to face. Come Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit come. In the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for a deeper knowledge and love of the God who knows and loves us completely. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
And let's continue in prayer as we pray the church's special prayer for thy kingdom come. Let's say this together. Almighty God, your ascended Son has sent us into the world to preach the good news of your kingdom. Inspire us with your spirit and fill our hearts with the fire of your love, that all who hear your word may be drawn to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time together now. But as always on a Sunday, how we depart is important. As we depart back into the routine day by day, will the coming, a reminder of the coming of the Spirit, change us? All across the nation today, churches are ending their services with a special commissioning prayer for thy kingdom come. And I'm going to invite you to join with them today. Please would you stand for this? For 50 days since Easter, we've celebrated the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over the powers of sin and death. We've proclaimed God's mighty acts and we've prayed the power that, that power that was at work when God raised Jesus from the dead might be at work in us. We have proclaimed God's mighty acts and we have prayed that the power that was at work when God raised Jesus from the dead might be at work in us. As part of God's church here in Worcestershire, I call upon you now to live out what you proclaim. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, will you dare to walk into God's future, trusting him to be your guide? By the Spirit's power, we will. Will you dare to embrace each other and grow together in love? We will. Will you dare to share your riches in common and minister to each other in need? We will. Will you dare to pray for each other until your hearts beat with the longings of God? We will. Will you dare to carry the light of Christ into the world's dark places? We will. And so as we finish, let's sing a song inviting God's spirit to come and empower us. Come down, O love divine.
Well, thank you for joining us in worship today. Please do invite others to join us week by week as we worship. Uh, and don't forget to join in with the other services we're doing through the course of the week as well. If this is your first time with us today, we hope you enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. And if there's anything we can do to help you in your spiritual journey in the meantime, do please get in touch. Barry at hopechurchfamily.org. We long for the day when we can all gather together again. But in the meantime, stay safe and stay prayerful. May the spirit who hovered over the waters when the world was created breathe into you the life he gives. Amen. May the spirit who overshadowed the virgin when the eternal son came among us make you joyful in the service of the Lord. Amen. May the spirit who set the church on fire upon the day of Pentecost bring the world alive with the love of the risen Christ. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Filled with the Spirit's power, go in the light and peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Let's finish with the words of the grace. <laughs> May... The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and, and the love of God, 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 God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.